morning. My name is Di Hanna, and I will be your conference operator today. I would like to welcome you to Canopy Growth's third quarter fiscal 2020 financial results conference call. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. I will now turn the call over to Judy Hong, Vice President, Investor Relations. Judy, you may begin the conference call. Thank you, and good morning, everyone. Uh, we're glad that you have taken the time to join our third quarter fiscal 2020 financial results conference call. On our call today, we have David Klein, our CEO, and Mike Lee, our CFO. Before the markets opened today, we issued a news release announcing our financial results for our third quarter fiscal 2020 ended December 31st, 2019. This news release is available on Canopy Growth's website and has been filed on CDAR. Certain matters discussed in today's call or answers that may be given to questions could constitute forward-looking statements. Actual results could differ materially from those anticipated. Risk factors that could affect results are detailed in the company's annual information form and other public filings that are available on CDAR. During the call, we will refer to supplemental non-GAAP measures, adjusted EBITDA, and free cash flow. Adjusted EBITDA and free cash flow are defined in the press release issued this morning, as well as this period's management discussion and analysis documents filed in CDAR. Please note that all financial information is provided in Canadian dollars unless otherwise noted. Following prepared comments by David and Mike, we will conduct a Q&A session. To ensure that we get to as many questions as possible, we ask that analysts to limit themselves to one question. With that, I'll now turn the call over to David. David? Thank you, Judy, and good morning, everyone. I'm very excited to be on this, my first earnings call as CEO of Canopy Growth. To begin my remarks, I'll offer a perspective on why I decided to join Canopy. First, I believe the cannabis market is one of the most exciting business growth opportunities of our lifetime. We are taking part in the creation of a new regulated consumer market, the likes of which we have never seen. Second, having been an early advocate of Constellation Brands' investment in canopy growth and having been on the board since October 2018, I firmly believe canopy is well positioned to win in the global cannabis market. We have a leading market share in the recreational market in Canada and a strong position in the medical market in both Canada and abroad. Additionally, I believe Canopy has the opportunity to create an unassailable global position in cannabis. Canopy possesses excellent know-how, industry experience, intellectual property, and talent. The combination of these assets has the ability to set us apart from the competition. Another asset of Canopy's that cannot be overlooked is the strength of our balance sheet. In a sector where capital is becoming increasingly costly, if it's available at all, the value of having $2.3 billion in cash cannot be understated. Our job is to nurture these strengths and ensure that we build a profitable, world-class company with brands that consumers trust. Now, I know you'll have many questions about what I'm planning to do, especially in light of what's going on in our industry. Make no mistake, we have a lot of work to do. I'll detail our path forward during our fourth quarter earnings call once I've completed my assessment. However, you can be assured that I am, along with the management team, already taking actions that will keep us in the leadership position of the cannabis industry. For now, let me highlight my key priorities. My first priority will be improving Canopy Growth's connection with our consumers. The winner in this market will possess the brands that are most trusted and most loved by our consumers. We will leverage our consumer insights, intellectual property, and production capability to consistently deliver consumer-preferred products that deliver the best quality at each price point. My second priority is bringing more focus and discipline to our organization. As this new nascent industry developed over the past five years, playing across the board made sense due to uncertainty about industry direction. The industry, however, has evolved, and we now need to focus on specific markets and product lines where we have the legitimate right to win. This means deciding where we won't play as well as where we will. 
My third priority is to define a very visible path to profitability and positive cash flow. This means we need to align our resources and investments with the size and growth rate of the market as it exists today. We've begun taking steps designed to bring our inventory in balance with our supply demand forecast. This includes a thorough strategic review of our footprint, which is underway. Mindful of future market growth, we're prepared to take initial steps to right-size our business over the next 90 days. My final priority is building the company and management's credibility with all stakeholders. We will do this by delivering on our commitments in a thoughtful and measured fashion. Let me now briefly cover some business highlights. First, the Canadian recreational market. Overall consumer demand remains strong and Canopy continues to hold a leading market share in recreational cannabis markets across the country. At retail and using data published by provincial agencies in StatScan, Canopy is number one in Nova Scotia, number one in Prince Edward Island, and number two in Ontario. In Alberta, the country's most developed market, Canopy continues to hold the number one spot, accounting for roughly 30% of the market. Our same store retail sales increased 11% on a quarter over quarter basis. Sales of dried flour remain strong across all price ranges. <clears throat> Notably, strong demand continued for our value price TWD strain as well as for premium strains. Moving to medical cannabis markets. We are seeing our sales increase in the Canadian medical market thanks in part to a growing customer base. It's not notable that sales of oil and soft gels account for over 60% of our Canadian medical sales. We're encouraged by the progress we're making in key European markets with strong sales in Germany. In the U.S. market, we achieved an important milestone with online sales of first and free branded hemp-derived CBD products beginning in December 2019. I'm excited about the U.S. market opportunity. Providing Canopy with the resources to enter the U.S. market was a key driver of Constellation's most recent investment. That said, we recognize that we want to and need to move faster and make bolder moves in the U.S. We're focused on creating brands that resonate with our consumers and making sure we can get distribution of our products in places where our consumers can legally purchase them. Now, before I hand the call over to Mike, I'd like to provide an update on our Cannabis 2.0 launch in Canada. Since the very beginning of our 2.0 product development, Canopy has been committed to bringing the highest quality, most differentiated products to market. We believe this is the best business approach to win over the long term. Our first edible products, premium chocolate products, shipped out of our Smith Falls facility in December 2019. Multiple products, Tokyo Smoke Go, Tokyo Smoke Pause, and Tweed Baker Street entered the market in December and have been selling out very quickly. Our next offering, Bean and Bud, is on track to be in market late February with additional SKUs following in the first quarter of fiscal 2021. For our vape product offering, we focused on delivering products with differentiated levels of safety, functionality, and design. All of our products will meet Underwriter Laboratories, or UL 8139 safety standards. Our Juju Power, the sector's only UL 8139 certified rechargeable battery for 510 cartridges, began shipping in December and entered the market in early January 2020. We're seeing strong demand for these devices. For our 510 cartridges and proprietary pod-based Tokyo Smoke Luma, we expect to be in market over the next few months. Now, this is later than we previously communicated, but we felt our highest priority is to ensure that we provide our consumers with the highest quality and safest products possible, even if it means delays to our in-market dates. Lastly, Canopy has long believed in the low-calorie, 
high-quality cannabis beverages that rival alcohol beverages in the taste and social experience they deliver, would create a new consumer segment and expand the overall cannabis category. Leveraging considerable intellectual property, Canopy has formulated a range of beverages that I believe will delight our consumers. I know some of you had a chance to taste the non-active version of our products, but let me say this. The active versions are a whole new ballgame. To add some color here, a few weeks ago, myself and other board members tasted live versions of our cannabis beverages. After the tasting, a fellow board member sent me a text the text read simply, game changer. I share that opinion. In our view, we truly have a unique and differentiated beverage, which based on our competitive tasting, you can't find anywhere. We also see our cannabis beverage as truly disruptive and the best vehicle to attract new consumers to the cannabis market. In other words, we believe it will do more to recruit new consumers than any other product format in our industry creating new consumption occasions and a whole new industry. Just think about how big hard seltzers in the U.S. became in just three years. So we are going to take the next few months to get it right and ensure that we can introduce our consumers of today and of the future to a true game changer. Lastly, and relatedly, I would like to take a brief moment to acknowledge and applaud the Ontario government's recent initiation of public consultation on providing consumers with more choice and convenience on cannabis and business opportunities, including consumption venues. The consultation is the first major milestone that's required to move forward with providing Ontarians with safe, convenient access to regulated cannabis while providing more support for private sector business opportunities. This concludes my remarks, and I'll now pass the call over to Mike to review our third quarter fiscal year 2020 financial results in greater detail. Great. Thanks, David. Good morning, everyone. Let me begin my remarks with a brief review of the progress that we made during our third quarter of fiscal 20. Total net revenue grew 13%, excluding the impact of portfolio restructuring charges last quarter. Our business generated gross margins of 34% before fair value impacts. Total SG&A decreased 14% quarter over quarter. And adjusted EBITDA came in at a loss of $92 million compared to a loss of $156 million last quarter. I will now move on to a more detailed review of select items. Our top line performance benefited from a broad base of growth in our core cannabis business, as well as our strategic acquisition. Here are a few highlights. Canada recreational revenue increased 10%, benefiting from balanced growth across our B2B and B2C channels. And we are pleased with the growth of flower sales, which were driven in part by higher sales of premium strains and a greater than 50% increase in the sales of pre-roll joints. Our B2C revenue increased 16% over uh, prior quarter, due in part to an 11% increase in same-store sales. Canadian medical sales increased by 5% quarter over quarter, driven in part by an increase in the number of customers to over 76,700. International medical increased 3% quarter over quarter, as our sales in Germany benefited from opportunistic sales to fill supply gaps created by a regulatory hold on products of another vendor. Revenue generated by C3 increased by 5% over the prior quarter, driven by continued growth in demand for the uh, cannabinoid-based <laughs> therapies. <clears throat> and over the past year, Canopy has made a number of strategic acquisitions that are performing as expected. Sales of these businesses are captured at our other revenue section of our P&L, and they saw over 40% growth against the prior quarter. Sales of stores and Bickel vaporizers increased 46% over the last quarter due to solid organic growth, as well as seasonal sales over the Christmas holiday season. And we estimate the seasonal timing benefit added around 5 million of incremental revenue during the quarter. 
This works revenue increased 42% on solid organic growth. And our latest acquisition, BioSteel, also contributed a full quarter of revenue. We are pleased with the performance of our strategic acquisitions and point out that Stores & Bickle, ThisWorks, and BioSteel accounted for nearly 22% of our revenue in the quarter. Looking forward to the fourth quarter, taking into consideration some timing benefits we saw during the third quarter, we anticipate our overall revenue to be up modestly versus the third quarter. I would now like to take a few moments to provide Canopy's perspective on a dynamic that we are seeing in the Canadian Rec Channel. Over the past number of weeks, we've seen examples of aggressive pricing by some competitors, which began in earnest in the back half of the third quarter. And we expect these isolated pricing actions to continue, as our market intelligence suggests that these competitors are focused on freeing up cash from their long inventory positions. At the same time, we see strong consumer demand for premium, high THC strain products as evidenced by the well over 50% growth we saw in our LBS Sunset premium flour and pre-roll joints during the quarter. We believe our brand architecture is working as we focus on building brand equity while offering consumers a range of products across premium, mainstream, and value price points. And we will continue to monitor the market and adjust as needed to remain competitive but TWD will continue to serve as our price fighter in the value segment. Now let me briefly cover gross margin. <clears throat> gross margin in the third quarter of fiscal 20 before IFRS fair value impacts was $42 million or 34% of net revenue. Gross margin in the quarter benefited from higher capacity utilization, which is a trend that we've seen over the past few quarters. Operating costs related to underutilized facilities has continued to decrease from approximately $24 million in the fourth quarter of fiscal 19 to under $8 million in the third quarter of fiscal 20. The growth of our higher margin consumer product businesses such as SMB and ThisWorks also had a positive impact to gross margin during the quarter. We remain committed to delivering 40% gross margins in the short term, as we expect ongoing reductions in various period costs, but we recognize that there are delays in our beverage and vape products will serve as a modest headwind in the short, wind, short term, and it's also worthwhile highlighting that the, any right sizing on our supply could introduce some short-term headwinds as well. Speaking briefly about operating expenses, Total OPEX declined 14% versus the prior quarter, and GNA declined by over $20 million versus last quarter as a couple of dec uh, discrete expenses were not repeated in the third quarter, uh, as well as to focus on continued cost controls in this area. Share-based compensation expenses decreased from $92.9 million in the second quarter to $61.7 million in the third quarter. And the decline in stock-based compensation was due to certain one-time benefits as well as reductions that resulted from the restructuring of our share-based compensation program that I spoke about last quarter. Looking forward to fiscal 21 and with the restructurings that we made, we expect share-based compensation to be 30 to 40 percent lower than in fiscal 20. Further, we expect share-based compensation to normalize over time at between $125 and $150 million per year, depending on headcount. I highlight that we provide a full discussion of our operating expenses in our MDNA, so in the interest of brevity, we are eliminating a comprehensive discussion of operating expenses from our press release and from this conference call, and you can expect this to be our standard practice in the future. Moving on to free cash flow. Our free cash flow in the third quarter of fiscal 20 was an outflow of $360 million, which is a 16% improvement over the second quarter of fiscal 20. And as David highlighted in his remarks earlier, a key priority is to reduce cash burn. And I am confident that the work that we started in January will identify opportunities 
to reduce operating expenses and will moderate our capital expenditures as we seek to focus our efforts and align our organization to our key priorities. Another key focus area is better managing supply and to work towards having a supply and demand balance as quickly as possible. During the third quarter, our inventory before fair market value adjustments increased $81 million versus the last quarter. Acquisitions and our U.S. hemp harvest contributed around $20 million of this increase, but the balance was driven by an increase in our semi-finished goods such as resins, distillates, and isolate. As David indicated in his prepared remarks, we have initiated a thorough review of our production footprint and we plan to act quickly to right-size our supply to align with the current market demand while ensuring that we can deliver on our margin commitments. Next, I would like to provide a brief update on our transition to U.S. GAAP. Our preliminary view of the change in accounting principles has identified a number of changes to the consolidated statement of operations, and I will highlight a few of them now. First, under U.S. GAAP, there is no biological asset accounting. Under U.S. GAAP, agricultural products are accounted for at cost, and this change will have no impact on our adjusted EBITDA metric. Second, under U.S. GAAP, the amortization of right-of-use assets is no longer considered as a component of depreciation and amortization expense, and as such, is not excluded from adjusted EBITDA going forward, and this will have an impact of reducing our adjusted EBITDA by an estimated $10 million on an annualized basis. The third item to be aware of is in our accounting for other financial assets and financial liabilities there will be changes in the classification of certain other financial assets and liabilities, which will result in fair value adjustments impacting net income, and this is in lieu of reporting against OCI or other comprehensive income. And as these fair value adjustments are currently excluded from adjusted EBITDA, there will be no impact as a result of the change to U.S. GAAP. Finally, I would like to provide just a brief update on some of the priorities I covered during our last call. We are making tremendous progress in re-engineering our financial close and reporting processes, and we expect to achieve the accelerated close timelines required at our fiscal year end. We continue to make progress in improving our control environment and we've begun testing the effectiveness of end-user computing controls, and we are on track to remediate the currently reported material weakness by the end of the fiscal year. We've also made solid progress in the design of our SAP ERP solution, which will eventually roll out across the entire enterprise, and we are on track to roll out the SAP solution in the United States beginning in the first quarter of fiscal 21. This now concludes my review of Canopy Gross Financials for the third quarter fiscal 20 ended December 31st, 2019, and we are happy to take questions from analysts at this time. At this time, if you would like to ask a question, please press star then the number one on your telephone keypad. To ensure an efficient call that gets to questions of as many analysts as possible, Analysts are requested to limit themselves to one question. Once again, press star 1 on your telephone keypad to ask a question. Your first question comes from the line of Chris Carey of Bank of America. Hi, good morning. Good morning. Uh, first of all, David, uh, congratulations on your new role. Um, and, and I guess, you know, like clearly a number of line items were quite a bit ahead of expectations on, on revenue and profit, right? But I, I think as you implied in, in, in the prepared remarks, the one area which still underwhelmed, you know, was free cash flow, which, which is really where I think the debate around the Canopy story is, is focused now. And, and it sounds like we're going to get more details around that in fiscal Q4. So, you know, perhaps I'll, I'll approach this question a little differently. 
Um, you, you know, you mentioned that managing inventory relative to demand was a key focus, and, and you're reviewing your footprint. Clearly, that could imply shutting down some production capacity. And, and I just wonder, from a practical standpoint, you know, how, how difficult is that kind of endeavor? And what could that mean to near-term margins, even if positive for the long term? And, and I guess connected to that is, uh, Mike, you had mentioned that you'll expect to get the 40% gross margin over time. Potentially, that's a mixed comment on the fiscal Q4, but does that imply that the 40% is more kind of a fiscal 21 reality? Um, anyway, so so thanks for all those. Yeah, sure. So, uh yeah, Chris. So first of all, uh, we are not going to run out of cash, uh, and we have a lot of levers to pull in that regard. And as as I indicated, we'll talk about that more on the on the next call. Uh, clearly, we have to do a better job managing inventory and overall working capital. Uh, we have to slow our capex spend. Uh, we we will pull back on the M and A activity that the business has been doing and. You know, we we need to do a better job with our P&L. So so literally, we need to work across every line item. We're we're going through a review process. I've I've been in the role actually. Uh, it's one month today, uh, and uh, I will say that the team is uh, a fairly uh, a very strong team uh, at, at the leadership level at Canopy. And the team is very committed to the objectives that I talked about, my priorities that I talked about in my script. Uh, so I'll let Mike comment on the timing of margin achievement, but we will do the right thing for our stakeholders, which means our shareholders, our consumers, uh, and our employees. And um, we'll communicate that as soon as we can. And then when we do, there will be an obvious flow through that uh, will have to be taken into account. Yeah, and I just I would just add to that that whatever we do, we want to do it with an eye toward not just what works for today, but what works for the long term as well. And uh, as you guys have heard me talk about over the last year, starting up and shutting down facilities is really hard. So we need to be very thoughtful about it, very mindful about it, and we're taking a strategic approach to say, look, we want to make sure that we're designing our uh, supply chain and our footprint for not just the realities of today, but the realities of the next year, two years, three years, as the size of the market develops, but also as the various categories of the market develops. And we know that the value category is here to stay. We're quite happy with how TWD is performing in the market, and we want to make sure that regardless of what consumers are buying, that we've got line of sight to deliver our target margin profile across the entire range of products that we offer to our consumers. So that's the work that's underway and really to engineer the ideal supply chain that allows us to achieve those financial objectives. So in the short run, are we going to face some headwinds with some of the cannabis delays? Yes. Are we going to face some headwinds from some potential deleveraging of facilities in the short run as we make some fine-tune adjustments? Yes. Is that going to move us materially off of our 40% gross margin goal? I do not think it will. Your next question comes from the line of Glenn Matson of Ladenburg Thalman. Uh, hi, yeah, thanks for taking the question. Um, uh, David, you made very specific comments about the U.S. market opportunity. I believe you said... Um, that you, you, you see a need to move faster in, in the U.S. creating brands uh, specifically and getting and getting distribution to uh, customers who can buy them. So I'm curious uh, if what you meant by that a little bit. Number one is, um, do you see yourselves having to make a significant uh, further investment in the U.S.? And then number two, when you mentioned customers who can buy them, are you talking about uh, THC-based products to customers in the U.S.? And maybe just flesh out those comments a little further. Thank you. Yeah, so you know where we sit today, it's really focused on hemp-derived CBD, uh, and there are states where where we're we're, we're free to, um, uh, you know, to sell our products, and other states where we're not. So that was really the the point of that uh, comment. 
Uh, and, and I don't see significant in, investments, clearly no incremental capital required in the U.S. It's really more about getting our brands on the shelf at retail um, as much as we possibly can across the U.S. Uh, we launched First and Free in December. It was mostly uh, uh, an, an e-commerce launch. We now need to get on the shelf with First and Free and with some of our other products such as BioSteel um, uh, uh, with CBD uh, in, in the U.S. So it really is more about execution. And, you know, quite frankly, Glenn, I think that's a point that I can make about Canopy in general. I think we're, we're well positioned in terms of uh, uh, product development and uh, production capacity. We now need to begin to really connect with that consumer and execute uh, from a sales standpoint and a brand building standpoint so that we can create that, um, those trusted brands uh, in the minds of the consumer. That's the next stage of our evolution and clearly we'll be focused on that in the U.S. Your next question comes from the line of Vivian Azur of Cowan and Company. Hi, good morning, and congrats, David, on the new role. Um, thank you very much for the prepared remarks. Um, I was hoping to get some perspective strategically, David, from you on kind of the balance of priorities between top line growth and profitability. It seems from, from your commentary that clearly there's a laser focus on right sizing the business from both you and Mike, which I think is encouraging. Um, but you, you know, did uh, make a point of, you know, reinforcing your market share leadership in the category. And so I'm just trying to understand, you know, it, how committed are you to market share leadership? It, it, are you willing to sacrifice that to attain your profit aspirations? Because given your background, you certainly, I think, would be comfortable not being a market leader, but, you know, operating from a position of market share gains once you've achieved the right profitability framework. So any commentary on that would be helpful. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. So, so, look, that's why we haven't raced to put out, you know, cut numbers, um, uh, you know, for, for staff, which you're seeing across the industry, because I think it's important to understand where we need to win and where we want to win and where we can profitably play in the, in the business. And then we'll continue to invest in those areas and we'll pull back spend from the areas that, that don't uh, fit into that category. I, I think... The thing that we do have to keep in mind, though, is that we are in a growth industry, and I know there's a bit of a pall over the industry of late, um, but, but we need to keep in mind that this is a growth industry. We're still attracting new consumers to the space. Um, we see ways for us to be profitable across the spectrum as, uh, in, of, of consumer preference, as Mike talked about uh, our ability to be profitable at the value end as well as our ability to be profitable at the, at the premium end. And we just need to get our business focused on executing in, in, those, uh, in those areas. I think, I think there is uh, uh, a school of thought, though, that we can continue to drive uh, industry share leadership and improve profitability at the same time by simply creating a tighter focus on, uh, on the consumer um, uh, proposition. Your next question comes from the line of Adam Buckham of Scotia Bank. Hey, good morning. Thanks for taking my question. Um, so I was just hoping we could get a little more color on the B2B segment. Um, so just want to get an idea whether there was any bulk sales in the quarter, and if there was, what the magnitude of those were versus previous quarters. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Adam. Um, we did have some bulk sales in the prior quarter. This quarter was uh, non-existent, uh, to my knowledge. Um, continues to be an area of consideration as we think about right-sizing our inventories across certain, certain segments of the value tier, but at this point, we're focused on getting our product to market, not, not necessarily pursuing wholesale, but that's an option that continues to exist. Okay, great, thanks. Yep. Your next question comes from Andrew Carter of Stifle. Hi, good morning. 
I just want to return to kind of the comment around the modest revenue growth quarter over quarter and just kind of help, kind of help us understand what that means for the rec business. You called out the $5 million of seasonality, suggesting a 119 base, but in, how should we be thinking about Canadian recreational business? I would assume that the business is now kind of aligned where shipments will better match kind of the consumption growth of the market. Should we be factoring in a lot of price compression? You obviously will have some second wave shipments. Just help us understand how you're thinking about that line item. Sure, Andrew. Uh, we, we, we're we not modeling in um, anything for price compression at this point. We are modeling in that the, the mix in the category continues to evolve as PWD establishes itself in the marketplace, and that, that, that brand is, is, is performing quite well. But the high end is also performing quite well. The pre-rolls are performing quite well. Uh, my comments around the modest growth in the quarter are really driven by just, you know, as I mentioned, uh, some of the seasonality benefits uh, from SMB and even our retail stores uh, in Canada benefited from a very strong December. So there's a bit of a headwind going into the next quarter as a result of that. Um, and, you know, store count continues to increase. And you're correct, we are seeing tremendous benefits of supply chain stability. All the provinces are now uh, getting their inventories in order and we're starting to establish the cadence of not quite a mature industry, but there's line of sight to getting to a mature industry in the near term. Um, and quite honestly, our biggest opportunity today to grow in what's you know, relatively a static sort of uh, store count environment is continuing to get the right product at the right time as the purchase orders come in from the from the provinces, uh, driving our fill rates up by better forecasting and better fulfillment. So that's where our growth is going to come from in the near term. And then as the stores continue to increase, we'll, we'll continue to deliver. Your next question comes from the line of John Zamparo of CIBC. Thanks. Good morning. Um, I wanted to ask about the retail function at, at Canopy. Um, so subsequent to the quarter, you announced a meaningful increase in the total footprint uh, in terms of the Ontario licensed lottery winners. Um, so I assume it's fair to say that you've seen something about retail that's made you want to get more involved. So I'm, I'm wondering, is it as simple as unit level economics early attractive, or, or is it more the ability to sell your own brands? Uh, but just would like to get a sense of how you view retail and, and maybe how much capital you might allocate to that over the next couple of years. Thanks. Yeah, great. Uh, so yeah, store count continues to increase. I think we added 15 stores in the quarter, 12 stores in the quarter, from 15 to 27. Uh, between own stores and partner stores. Uh, but we, we're very happy with our store performance. And the economics become very attractive uh, in our stores when uh, canopy share of store sales reach that 60% plus range, which um, you know, we're starting to see across our network. Um, but that gives us the best opportunity to, to build brands, to educate consumers, uh, it allows us to do pop-up activities to help educate consumers on different formats and, and things like that. And then as, as Cannabis 2.0 rolls out, it's going to be an incredibly valuable uh, format for introducing new consumers to these new products as well. So we expect to continue to add stores in a very strategic way. Um, Ontario is our biggest opportunity in front of us, and we had a press release about that a few weeks ago that I'm sure you saw. Uh, so it continues to be a priority for us. Your next question comes from the line of Michael Lavery of Piper Sandler. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, you touched on a couple of the drivers of the inventory build and, and obviously some of the 2.0 launch and, and building into that is, is a part of it as well. Can you just give us a sense of how it's likely to evolve from, from here and and was this last quarter the peak inventory levels, or is there any reason it might actually still go higher? How do we, how do you see that working down, and, and at what kind of speed? So I'll let, I'll let maybe Mike comment on some of the details, but you know my early observations, uh, Michael, are that um, you know we're, we're uh, as a company we've built inventory, um, but 
we need to get better at connecting the consumer demand signal to the inventory that we're building so that we can deliver that high-end consumer experience that is expected of, uh, you know, leaders in a space. And I think we're in the early innings of brand building in cannabis. And so we need to be on the shelf with the high THC bud that the consumer is demanding at the right price points. Uh, and so for us, we're going to continue to make sure that we're not stocking out at retail, which is uh, not good for us. It's not good for brand building. It's not good for our retail partners. Um, at the same time, we need to be able to bring down our total inventory balance. And that, as I said, is the work that's going on as we look at our footprint because uh, we need to be able to both decrease our inventory, make sure we stay on the shelf at retail, and deliver the quality experience that's, that, that, that we feel should be expected of our brands. I would just, I think that's very comprehensive. I would just add, Michael, that I would not model that this is our peak quarter. I think as we do the strategic review, there's a lead time to any decisions that we make. That being said, I would not say that, you know, that the increase is going to be material in Q4. I just don't think we can call it a peak at this point until we finish the strategic review of our footprint. But directionally, we know that uh, we can do a better job of managing inventory relative to overall sales, and everyone knows the story of anticipated market growth and where we are. So we're, we're working through that as we speak. Okay, that's helpful. Thank you. You're welcome. Your next question comes from the line of Aaron Gray of Alliance Global Partners. Hi, thanks for the question. Um, I just want to dive back a little bit into the market share trend. So I believe you said 22% for the rec mark in the quarter. I think last quarter was just north of 25. So could you talk a little bit about the market share trends you saw during the quarter? Would it be fair to think that, you know, as the quarter went on, you saw the market shares fall as you saw that aggressive pricing from competitors? And then as we see this aggressive pricing of competitors and potential shakeout, is it fair to think that we continue to see some at least near-term share being um being lost with the aim of long-term share gains, as you've kind of made it clear that you're not going to kind of plan those, you know, super low-priced categories with the aim of coming out with more, you know, premium of products and just having TWD. So, you know, how us think about near-term shares and kind of that long-term share aspirations? Thank you. I'll, I'll, I'll take this one. So, yes, we, we did see some modest uh, share declines, as you referenced, but I would also point out that there's been some variability in that as the industry has developed. What I commented on earlier around uh, some of the isolated pricing actions, we've made a decision to not ch chase those price points in some instances. So there has been some shared impact as a result of that. However, our goal continues to be achieving between a 25 and 30 percent market share. There's going to be a little bit of noise with some of these isolated pricing actions that we think will go away. Uh, over the next several months, uh, but 25 to 30 percent is really our goal, and we think we're well positioned to achieve that. But yeah, you might see some noise in the numbers, uh, you know, between now and call it the longer term. And what, I'm, what I might uh, do, Aaron, is also almost come back to uh, Vivian's question and say, you know, we're, we we like to split in the market with maybe 40 percent is more premium of the total market. I'm saying. Uh, thirty percent is at value. We won't chase market share um, at at any cost. Uh, but w I think the best thing we can do to continue to drive market share for us is to make sure that for uh, our premium products that we are on the shelf consistently at retail. Uh, I think that that more than anything else can move the needle for us in terms of uh, share, holding share or growing share in the near term. Your next question comes from the line of Rupesh Parikh of Oppenheimer. Good morning. Thanks for taking my questions. So I wanted to go back to your other businesses and the, the acceleration that you saw there. So outside of, I know there was a seasonal benefit that you saw, but if you look at the stores in, in Beckle, Vaporizer business, and this works, just want to get a sense of in terms of what's driving the strength of both businesses and, and just how to think about them going forward outside of that seasonal benefit. Yeah, we have a, it's a few things. There's been a number of new items that we've, uh, you know, previously press released. Um, so innovation is driving a good portion of the growth. 
We have a new distribution agreement with GreenLane in the U.S., so we're seeing some good growth there as well. Uh, and we've built a good business. As you guys know, this is a fantastic brand. And as we talk about the brand building and being more consumer aware, uh, I think David and I are of the opinion, as uh, many of our management team is, S&B is an amazing brand that we could leverage for so much more than what we are today. So we're, we're working on uh, future plans to further exploit that brand globally. But a lot of innovation coming uh, next year as well. So, um, you know, we did have some seasonal benefits, but that being said, we still see that as a growth business over the next year or two. Any, anything new? Yeah, next question comes from Grain Quangler of 8 Capital. Yeah, hi, good morning. Thank you for taking my question. Um, I wanted to follow up, Michael, in the prepared remarks you mentioned um, that there was higher capacity utilization in the quarter. Um, when I look at the kilograms harvested figure, um, if my numbers are correct, it was around 29,000 kilograms this quarter. And in the previous quarter, it was 40,000 kilograms. So that number coming down, just wanted to square that away with the higher capacity utilization and also tying that back to uh, talking about right-sizing the footprint, whether we're already seeing some evidence of that given where the harvested number is going quarter over quarter. Thank you. Sure. Two things I would point out. Number one, given our large greenhouse footprint, yields vary throughout the year based on uh, the season. Uh, and yields certainly are lower in the October, November, December timeframe, which we model in and take that into account in all of our um, standard costing. Uh, during December, we did take down some capacity at our Delta facility in British Columbia is one of our first steps to help bring supply and demand into balance. There are some fixed cost uh, deleveraging impacts of that to the tune of around $850,000 a quarter, but we also believe that in concentrating our efforts at Delta, we actually get benefits uh, with the remaining facility and helping to improve yields there as well. So it's a very balanced um, approach. But um, when we think about broad utilization across our network, our overall network, despite the fact that yields ebb and flow throughout the year, the actual number of square feet in our facilities are operating more in line with their goal with the retrofit activity being largely complete. Your next question comes from the line of Owen Bennett of Jeffries. Morning, guys. Um, more of a modeling question from me. Um, obviously, because the other revenue line is um, accelerating quite strongly, which you expect to continue. I was just wondering, could you give any insight into gross margins um, in the other revenue um, businesses um, and even potentially kind of international medical business? Um, to kind of help with how we see that sort of gross margin progressing throughout the year and what support it will get. Thank you. Yeah. So, so Owen, my recommendation would be that we talk to you offline about that versus going into um, a lot of the details. But the S&B first and free uh, C3 businesses have all been performing. Um, at that 40% plus margin, and in some cases, C3 is materially above that, is our pharma-grade cannabinoid-based uh, business. Um, in terms of guidance on that from a modeling perspective, I think modeling S&B and first and free in that 45% range is a good estimate, and C3 has been in the you know 65 to 75% range, um, and we expect those to, to hold over the, the short term. Your next question comes from the line of Matt Bottomley of Conaccord. Yeah, thanks. Just wondering if you could provide any color on uh, the assumptions going into, I think it was about a $5 million price provision or sales allowance provision this quarter if related to his particular SKUs or, or any other assumptions. And then also, if I could just sneak in there, if there's any color on the proportion of your inventory balance uh, 
excuse me, at period end, how much of that relates to things like dry bud versus uh, product uh, in the pipeline to be launched in Cannabis 2.0. Thanks. Sure. Uh, so, yeah, we, we, we booked about $5 million in the quarter as a revenue provision. And I, I, I think just, you know, just, you know, going forward, as we think about revenue provision, it's a cost of doing business. And every CPG company I've ever worked at has always had an ongoing provision. And it's really a function of what are your customer agreements. In this industry, our customer agreements in Canada are very favorable to the customer, meaning they can return anything at any point in time, which is a more, uh, I'd say, liberal approach than what I've seen elsewhere. And hence, we take a slightly more cautious approach in booking revenue provisions. As I think about modeling going forward, you know, 3 to 4% of revenue is, is a very reasonable number given the risk profile, the amount of inventory that we see at the province level, um, and, and I would expect that to be kind of the, the normal range going forward. But we true it up every quarter. We look at what's actually come back, and it's meant to cover not just returns, but also any provisions for any potential markdowns or we call them buy downs at the, at the province level just for the inventory that's within their four walls. This is not meant to be a provision for what exists in retail. It's meant to be just a provision for what exists at the wholesale level. So as the wholesale inventories come down to that four to six million dollar range, there's just not much risk out there. So the five million is in terms of unpacking that for you. A million of that, million five, I think it was for potential returns on just random products across the supply chain where uh, provinces are, are long on certain SKUs. It's very immaterial. And the balance was a provision for potential pricing impacts on certain SKUs in certain markets where we're not quite aligned to our national pricing architecture and we wanted to provide that allowance so that we could get things lined up properly. But it's, you know, in the grand scheme of things, it's 4% of revenue and that's just going to be our, our normal course uh, going forward. Um, so I would build that in. Thank you. In terms of inventory, oh, and I think your part two of the question was on inventory, so I apologize. But on inventory, yeah, so our inventory, we think about our inventory really in, in a few buckets. Number one is how much of our inventory is distillates and um, isolates and whatnot. And uh, a lot of the inventory that we're showing there is the anticipation of cannabis 2.0. And, you know, jury's still out on how big each of these categories are going to be, but we are well positioned on the distillate and isolate to fuel whichever category of cannabis 2.0 SKUs really take off. And the shelf life on uh, the isolate is very high. So we don't have any concerns around quality uh, of that inventory relative to the shelf life. The balance of the inventory is really our bud inventory, and we feel very good that we're balanced on high THC bud. We feel very good that we're balanced on uh, low THC, high CBD bud. The mainstream bud, which is the balanced, is what we call it. We're, we're a little longer than what we'd like to be today, and, and that's the piece that we're continuing to work through. Your next question comes from the line of Jason Zenberg of PI Financial. Hi, thanks for taking my question. Um, just first of all, I wanted to um, applaud the, um, the reduction in operating expenses this quarter, especially in the G&A. Um, one line item there that I think is uh, you know, positive that it's increasing is the, uh, the R&D line. But I wanted sort of to dig into that uh, just for sort of future modeling purposes. Uh, you describe um, you know, the increase, and we're kind of in the mid-teens in terms of a percentage of revenue. Um, you know, talk about uh, some clinical trials of CBD-based, um, uh, you know, studies as well as some um, product testing for cannabis 2.0. So is this a sort of one-time bulge in, um, not one-time, but sort of, you know, over the next couple of quarters of bulge in R&D, or should we expect um, this line item to increase? Sort of what's, the, what's your long-term goal as a percentage of revenue? So, so, Jason, <clears throat> when, when uh, R&D is an area that uh, I've already spent some time on since I've been 
uh, in the role. Uh, I think as we look at focusing the business, we have to decide um, where we're going to invest from an R&D and innovation standpoint. And by the way, there's a bunch of stuff in that line item. It's not pure R&D. Some of it's, uh, some of it's uh, engineering activity. Some of it is even manufacturing engineering, right? So there's a lot of, there's a lot of noise in that line. Uh, when we get on the, on the call uh, in the fourth quarter and we're providing more clarity on specificity of uh, that focus that I want to bring to the business, um, we, we'll make sure that we address uh, the R&D line in detail. Your next question comes from the line of Pablo Zwainik of Cantor Fitzgerald. Thank you, and congratulations, uh, David, on your appointment and on the good quarter. Look, uh, just, uh, just one question, and it's a bit of an industry question. I think you said that um, value for you was 30% of the portfolio. I'm hearing from other people it's close to 50% of the industry. If that's what we are seeing in the flower market, you know, th does that say something about the Canadian consumer in cannabis being very thrifty? And does that bode badly for the 2.0 category as a whole, you know, given that the price points are much higher. If you can comment on that. And then just uh, if I can sneak in a quick follow-up, uh, it'd be nice if you can clarify of the other line, what percentage of that revenue is outside uh, North America? Thanks. I'll let Mike handle the, the revenue, uh, the other revenue. But, um, yeah, Pablo, so I think the thing that's uh, interesting to me is we have an existing consumer today that's been pulled largely from the illicit market uh, and if that consumer today is, if, if say 40% of the spend is happening in the premium segment in the market, so I'm kind of flipping your question around a little bit, um, you know, we feel pretty good about that because I think that looks like a lot of other CPG categories. Uh, it's my belief that as we bring 2.0 consumers in, they're likely to come in uh, at the higher uh, end of the category because they're going to want uh, as well as uh, premium bud, they're going to want experiences in other uh, uh, other uh, product categories like um, uh, like like vapes and um, edibles, uh, drinks, gel caps. We just see them coming in differently. Now, what I'll say though is that I believe that that's probably a longer build, uh, so it'll take a while for that market to evolve. I keep talking about. There are a lot of consumers that we in the market today, and we need to delight those consumers. But there are also a lot more consumers that don't even know that they love cannabis. Uh, but they will learn that over time, and I think those folks will come in um, at at higher at higher price points and at the premium end of the category. Thanks. And the other revenue. Your next question comes from the line of Andre Leno of National Bank. Hi, good morning, and uh, thanks for taking my questions. Uh, just, uh, just wanted to go back quickly on the cannabis 2.0, and particularly on the beverages uh, first. But just if you are able to clarify what uh, caused uh, the initial delay, uh, and where are you now uh, resolving the cause of that delay, uh, and then more on the overall 2.0 portfolio, like how do you see developing vis-a-vis uh, -vis the, the the dry bud uh, only that you have right now, and. Uh, how much uh, could it contribute towards, uh, say, your previous guidance of uh, 250 million uh, revenue per quarter? Thanks. So, so Chris, if you don't mind, I, I want to take uh, Pablo's question because he got cut off there. But um, we will follow up. Tyler can follow up. Judy can follow up with you. But international revenue today, rev defined as revenue outside Canada, is around 35 percent of total revenue. And Judy or Tyler will follow up with you after the call to make sure you get your questions answered. And with that, I'll turn it over to David to answer the beverage. Yes, yeah, so look, on beverages, uh, whenever you launch a, be launch a beverage, whether it's, uh, uh, you know, uh, alcoholic drinks, uh, non-alcoholic drinks, and clearly cannabis drinks, it takes a while to get your formulations exactly as you want them. You need to ensure that you're having appropriate um, uh, stability, that we want the product to look uh, appropriate when it's on the shelf. Uh, and, you know, we, we had time to do this work at lab scale um, leading up to um, uh, obtaining licenses on uh, from Health Canada on 2.0. But kind of post 
obtaining those licenses, we've only had a very short window of opportunity to go from lab scale production to commercial scale production. And, you know, we've had some issues um, uh, as we've made that jump. And also understand that it's a very involved uh, quality process that we're putting ourselves through because we believe these are spectacular products. We want to make sure that when the consumer tries them that they decide that this is this is their thing, right? So um, uh, we, we want to get it right. We're, we're taking maybe uh, more precautions uh, than would otherwise uh, happen in terms of, uh, of, of working our way through that quality process. We have some outstanding um, scientific and engineering and innovation talent uh, working on our 2.0 launches. And as I said, it's just taking longer than we would like, but we, we think it's worth getting, uh, getting the products right as opposed to just rushing them out there to, to make an in-market date. Your next question comes from the line of Chris Blake of Laurentian Bank. My questions have been answered. Thanks very much. Okay. Your final question comes from the line of John Chu of Desjardins Capital Markets. Hi, just quickly. Um, so with the aggressive uh, U.S. expansion on the product launches, we've got edible launches coming up now, and then it looks like you're going to be potentially adding quite a few more new retail stores, especially in Ontario. From a sales and marketing perspective, should we see that jump up uh, for the next several quarters at least while you try to position the products and the launches accordingly? No, I, again, we're, we're still doing the, the work, John, in, in preparing for kind of the, the next phase, actually even working on next year's plan. So uh, I don't have a definitive answer, but you, will, you won't see the number jump up. Those are all the questions at this time. This concludes today's conference. You may disconnect at this time.